Rowena, thank you for hopping on Freelancer Talks. Pumped to have you. Hey, where, where are you sitting? Oh, well, I'm actually standing at my standing desk, but uh, I was sitting down a minute ago. Matt, I'm in Zaragoza in Spain, near the Pyrenees, an hour and a half uh, from the Pyrenees, but I'm originally from Ireland. And when did you go to Spain? What's because I know you, you know, we met the <laughs> digital nomads, uh, but yeah, what's been your last five years? <laughs> my last five years? Well, I was in Dublin five years ago, but we're almost four years in Spain. Um, I would have started remote working in 2007, uh, back when there wasn't that many digital nomads. And I did do a bit of traipsing around Bali and Thailand, working from co-working, early co-working back then. But um, yeah, so I have a family now, Matt, which changes things slightly, but uh, I have a little girl who's seven. But that's one of the reasons I'm in Spain, actually, because one of the reasons I'm so passionate and advocate for remote working is uh, I love the lifestyle, of course, but my daughter has asthma and we had to leave Dublin because she was very sick to choose a drier climate in Spain. So remote work is very personal to me because it helped me improve my daughter's health. Oh, that's incredible. That's actually the first case I've heard of that one. I've heard a bunch where family had something happen. So they yeah. had to move to say Detroit or a yeah. different region, but oh, that's incredible. Okay. So you moved to, and how did you know Spain? Like, did, had well, you been we had some, or? yeah, well, we had some contacts. I was, I was working freelance in Dublin, actually with a couple of contracts, uh, trying to survive on very little sleep with a sick child, which some people tuning in might identify with. And my husband was working with a tech company remote five years ago. And they had a satellite office here in Zaragoza and a couple of other places in Europe. And we came and scoped it out and it's a very dry climate. And she was only three at the time. And we said, what, what have we got to lose? If we move, hopefully her, her, her health will improve. And it did. And also we were both remote. So, you know, you don't hear the stories about remote family moves so much, but it really changed our lives. And it meant I started building my business real remote. My husband, uh, he's moved on since he's with another tech company, but you know, it's all good because we had that flexibility. And as a woman to say from an equality perspective, it really helped me maintain my career. And I've always been freelance solopreneur since then. And having that option to first take care of her health, Matt, which meant that I could sleep and then work and earn uh, in the new place, in the new location. Also, of course, we had to learn Spanish and we all speak Spanish now, living here nearly four years. But I, I, I kept a lot of my Irish clients. I kept a lot of my international clients. And it's a real good example of how remote work can really enable career progression, uh, enable you to keep a career if you've got a challenging family situation. So I think this is one of the most under estimated slash talked about components of remote work because usually it's the young 20 to 30 year old you know person that's going to bali and showing off their blogging right and, and that's not reality reality is we're you know between 30 and 70 having a family having to worry yeah. about education and all that kind of stuff and so i love that and and one of the focuses that you know but we actually a lot in the book uh we bring up a lot of mothers that are able to keep yeah. their career going because of freelance and flash remote work so which i you know before we dive into what i what i think perfectly dovetails into that just let's hear a background of yourself. You know, you, you told us a little bit about yeah. Ireland, but yeah, let's, let's hear, hear, hear yeah, you. Yeah, so, so, so my early career was in telecommunications, working in digital marketing, marketing comms for Vodafone, for Avaya, for uh, various telecommunications companies. And I worked, as I said, back around 2007, I started working on a couple of remote teams and I began to travel. And I spent time experiencing a little bit of that mix of digital nomadism before I, you know, before I settled down with my family. And then um, about 10 years ago, I got interested in education, Matt, and lo looking at training, corporate training, how we train people in uh, and educate them in virtual communications, a little bit of marketing. And that changed over those years as I was moving to Spain to looking at virtual skill sets and remote team skill sets. And one of the main areas there that I've been interested in, and it's because I live it every day, is self-leadership and self-management. And within that individual worker well-being. So my career then progressed to working, I'm still with the university as an adjunct a member of faculty. I teach on two remote work courses. They're the only ac academically accredited ones that I know of in Europe. And I'm really proud that I co-developed co them with two colleagues. And it's looking at really practical skills for undergrad students in what they need to remote work. 
So that's one strand of where I am now with my business, but other parts of my business also includes working with lots of big insurance companies, well-being providers for teams and for individuals. And that's the bit that I love because like we were talking about before, it keeps me right, it keeps me sane. I remind myself every day that I chose remote work as a way of working before COVID, before the hype, before it was forced, because it enabled me to take a nap in the middle of the day when my daughter was sick and I needed to catch up and then go back and pick up on my work in the evening. It gave me that flexibility. It kept my career alive when it looked like it could be shut down. And the reason I love it is why today I try to advocate for that work-life balance and that really, you know, for the freelancers listening, how important it is to be your own self-leader in terms of your well-being. That when you turn up at the computer, you want to turn up as your best self. So that often means looking at your downtime map, not what you're doing when you get here, it's what you've done outside of work. I mean, life is limited at the moment because we can't maybe move around as much. I understand the challenges, but even more so, I believe you have to look at what nourishes you as a person. Yeah. Exercise, downtime, music, creativity, whatever. Yeah, no, that's, so that, that's incredible. So at a, at a high level, the self-leadership and self-management mm -hmm. is sort of, a, I think, a good topic that we can use to drive the rest of the discussion. And I think what's really, really crucial about that is, listen, when you're working for yourself, one of the things that we've taken for granted is when you work for a company, they spent millions of dollars to figure out leadership principles and training to put you in a position to succeed. And so like if, you know, if a company's paying you say hundred K a year, they're really spending actually 150 K a year on you so that they can implement things like leadership training. Yet when you're on your own, there's none of that. So I'm, I'm so pumped and I'll dovetail into the next. And one thing I do want to call out is uh yeah, you started in 07. So this is, uh, you know, this is great. It's not two people who started doing this six months ago and are claiming experts. So, <laughs> hell yeah. No. Let's, 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 so, no. and, and, and I think one other call out too that I want to make sure, you know, those listening can hear is like you said, you were one of the first professors to actually focus on remote work slash having two, two remote work courses. That is, yeah. I remember when I was in college, I didn't have that. In fact, I was yeah. like, to use an iphone to email so no this is well, well, crucial, well right yeah well let me give you just one practical example i've just yeah. ended some assessment some marking for one of the courses and we did peer review video presentations so the students had to come on present a topic and then they peer reviewed each other through the learning system so they have been taken through the principles of good remote presentations good remote yeah. meeting practice and then so imagine getting getting been shown that like we using zoom using whatever system understanding how to present prepare your background speaking slowly using captions all those things are practically in the courses i'm involved with because i work with two full academic lecturers and they go rowena you're working remote your company is remote your <laughs> your full operations are remote what do we need and i'm like oh we need to actually give them the skills in practice so they know how to do it. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, we, I want to have, a, I want to have five hours with you just to talk about <laughs> how to, how to take a meeting from the boardroom to, to the zoom room. Uh, but what would you say are some of the like key differences? And I think one thing I really want to hone in on actually is like, how, how do you say this? A lot of times when people talk about remote, they're trying to translate the office into a remote setting. Mm -hmm. And I always say that's a horrendous idea because there's bad things about the office we don't have to replicate. There's good things we should, but there's bad things we don't have to. So mm -hmm. what would you say are some of the key differences between in-person meetings and remote and remote meetings, especially the peer review, right? That's so- Well, the, 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 the main thing is you don't have those visual cues. You don't have that, you know, if you show, if you show a picture of five people together in a meeting room with a flip chart mat with yeah. sharing computers sharing paperwork um having a coffee making eye contact having tactile all these things we can hardly remember now in our new world yeah. that's all gone and so everything has to be so much more intentional from do we need the meeting in the first place yeah very important <laughs> when it's a virtual meeting right through to the planning before it then filling those gaps in the actual virtual meeting. 
So have you written up pre-notes, for example, Matt? Have you shared information? Because again, in a physical meeting, you might go, here's the framework I want to present to you guys. And you just yeah. throw out a piece of paper on the table. We can't do that. People can sit and digest it. Whereas if you can share it beforehand and send it yeah. out. So the planning is so important. And then that what's called sometimes over communication or intentional communication. Yeah. And what happened during early the early stages of pandemic everyone moved to too many meetings as you know there was that knee jerk mm -hmm. there was just a meeting like too many meetings and we caused total zoom fatigue and people just being worn out and one good thing that came from that bad experience is people have gotten better in what i've seen and they are why are you asking for the meeting what's the purpose yeah. you know what is there pre-reading what can i do to prepare is there someone taking notes is there actions afterwards but again, working in this virtual world, I mean, yeah. you and I are doing it, hopefully looking, you know, doing it because we're seasoned. We cannot assume, and this is because of digital literacy, and I want to call this out because there may be people who yeah. tune in and go, I'm really uncomfortable on video. I don't know how to use video. And isn't it interesting, a good teacher or a good leader even, and they would go hand in hand, yeah. would work to the lowest common denominator. Do you know what I mean? They would say, who in the room doesn't understand or might have a trouble uh, with my language or my use of English, or could I use graphics to explain, or could I, they would work to that lowest common denominator. It's not a negative thing. Yeah. It's being inclusive and conscientious of your audience and also helping people to understand. And so what's happened is that's what you need to do as a person who understands how to run a meeting. You need to include everyone as much as possible and uh, you know it's not maybe the good news but if yeah. it will take more preparation and then you will achieve those things once you've been as explicit as possible in yeah. your exchanges and, and i think one the major thing that you just called out there so so to sort of summarize you mentioned the visual cues was one of mm. the things that's the most different right and mm. For your, we're going from, uh, how do you say it, in person where things can kind of be more spontaneous and off the cuff to when you're in a remote setting, it's easier to have fatigue when you're meeting like yes. this. So you have to you know, take some of that and make it intentional. Now, I think uh -huh. one thing that you called out that is a huge, huge, huge difference is when you mentioned, you called it inclusivity, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna try to call it a different word because I think that word is fluffy and feel good. Okay, <laughs> good. Doesn't have a KPI associated to it. Right? Oh, good. <laughs> like, thanks for telling me, twenty-three-year-old, you know, twenty-three-year-old millennial, about your inclusive policy. But like, what the hell is it actually doing for us? But so, when you say inclusivity, I think it's that lowest common lowest common yeah. denominator. Yeah. And what yeah. remote can do is it can distribute the ability for everyone to add value. So instead of having one usually, you know, macho person at the front yes. of the table stealing all the energy, remote says, mm -hmm. nope, we have five to 10 people in this room. Every mm -hmm. single person has looked at pre-notes. Every single person yes. has left comments prior. And one thing I love as a leader on, on, in remote settings is, you know, if you have that person who steals the air, <laughs> you mute them. Or it's easier to, to drive the conversation where everyone gets to speak. Exactly, um, exactly. And, and the little thing is, I mean, we all know kind of the science behind like this, right? Like when you're in a meeting and you, yeah. you put your hands back, so yeah. you feel bigger, you, you cross your yeah. legs, you seem like you care less. Yeah. That bullshit's gone. It's now about who actually has yeah. the, the insights. So, so true. Okay. So true. But Matt, just to say inclusive, I, and you, thanks for picking me up on that language. Uh, participative might be a better way of framing that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. because I've heard that and I have used that otherwise um, in other, and I love what you said there, and I, I've done this on a few projects recently, and I'm sure you've done it as well when you're leading remote teams. When you do um, a silent meeting and mm -hmm. to review a document or to review a pack, and, and if you're interested, I have some good links on that because I was working with a client on that recently and yeah. training up a, a remote team who have onboarded and never met, and they loved that concept of silent meeting. And afterwards the feedback was, it was so much more participative because it wasn't, you know, I, I'm a teacher, so I naturally want to try and, you know, speak and maybe suck the air up. But we, we I know it, I'm Shut Irish. Shut up, well. Rowena. <laughs> uh, I know it, I'm Irish as well. I can take it, I've been oh, on the geez. planet long. <laughs> You're gonna not stop talking and fight me. Let's, let's, let's. <laughs> but uh, that part, Participate that the silent meeting is yeah. one of the ways to to 
for people listening is one of the ways to maybe change that dynamic, change it. And it's really, so thank you for reminding me on that. Yeah, no, and, and we'll, listen, we'll include the links in the, in the show notes and, and we, we'll, yeah. you know, on YouTube and, and the site. Yeah, and, and I think just to add one last point to that too is uh, I think the greater thing that remote and freelance does is it enables individuals to do more with less. And so, you know, mm -hmm. the traditional path was you work at a company for 10 years, you can become finally a manager, director, you get your head count. What remote work does from a meeting perspective is it enables you, no matter how low on the totem pole you are, to be able to have more of an input because you're doing things like adding comments to the pre-notes or preparing in an intentional way, which is so cool. Because I think that's one thing when I, when I jumped into corporate, I was like, wait, why is there this clear hierarchy? Like this is, yes. this, this is BS. Like, sorry, but this 15 year old person doesn't know more than the five year old person just because mm -hmm. they look older. Yeah. Um, but it can happen. Okay. But so, yeah. So let's dovetail into the next thing that you were discussing. And I think it was the downtime. Because mm -hmm. we had a, one of the, we had a really cool meeting last week where one of our freelancers, she had tripled her income, but mm -hmm. her 21 goal, her FY21 goal was to set barriers. So not a, I want to take more time off. Mm -hmm. It was, I want to set barriers within the time that I intentionally spend mm -hmm. off. So mm -hmm. let's dovetail into what you discussed about this downtime. Mm -hmm. And I think the mm -hmm. greater talk is going to be about sort of the mental health, mental wellness. Yes. About yeah. how to make sure that we stay on our game. We're not burning out okay. more than just Zoom fatigue, but we're not, you know, totally crashing. So yeah. So let's dovetail into how the yeah. we stay mentally active, mentally ready, whatever. Um, yeah. Let's, let's dovetail into so that. So I love you. I, yeah. I love you said there, you gave the example of one of your freelancers. That, that because it sounds like she's come to that question from doing some goal setting, some value analysis, some goal setting and having her revenue and all that, but then also looking, where's my work-life integration? Where's my, where's my full holistic being, my full holistic worker that also wants to enjoy the fruits of my labor, switch off, go in and actually spend family time, friend time, whatever floats, whatever works for you. And so it's really interesting because those values are important for us just to say to people and those beliefs, because I come across a lot of clients and companies that are far down the track when they've lost that vision. So if you're a freelancer listening, even if you could write down, get a pen and paper and write down why you're working, what you want, what you're, you know, just even if it's to have the time to surf when we all, you know, to have the time to read the books I want, to spend the family time. It's so personal. For me, given my personal story, Matt, it's to enjoy the time with my healthy daughter, for example. Yeah. Right? Yeah. For example, and that's been personal. That is like at the top of my list because I lost that time when she was very sick and had to sleep a lot and was not very present. So that's something that I live to every day. And with part of that, this is where this profile, your self-care profile, your downtime profile, your work-life integration profile, whatever you want to call it. The, for example, GitLab have the rest ethic program that they're using with all their staff, encouraging people to take the downtime and to expand out the downtime. Now, I have for everyone who joins in um, a very simple self-care, right? Personalized self-care profile. I filled in my one. It's a template, right? That I'm going to give everyone. You can print it out. And in here we go through, I, I suggest anyone can do it. I do this with clients individually, but it's my gift to everyone because freelancers really need to watch their own self-management, their own self lead because they're responsible for their income. And it asks, it's very simple, Matt. It asks you to list what are your main self-care activities, right? That you want over a week, more than 40 minutes. Okay. And you can have on there your Pilates lessons, your swimming, your walks, your commute, whatever, right? Then, it, you know, it could even be listening to a podcast start to end. It could be reading two chapters of a book together, whatever. Yeah. Then it looks at the short breaks, the shorter moments, because this is what people often have problems with. They have a particularly busy day. They lose the significant. They might lose the lunch break, the Pilates class. They can't go for a walk because it's raining. And then they don't top up with some small things. Gotcha. Gotcha. Right? Gotcha. Like, like some meditation, a bit of breathing, listening to some classical music start to end, whatever, a short walk, you know, you fill in the gaps. What suits you, you will know. Preparing a meal, a healthy meal, whatever. Then we also, because we're in such exceptional times, need to, need to be investigating some new things. So we need to keep that 
self-care bucket topped up. So for example, I'm doing some mandala drawing at the moment. Whoa, whoa, <laughs> this is beautiful. You did this really now? I did this with my daughter the other day. We did it together. She's only seven. So I'm not like, I don't, I, this is why I love this work because I had to top up. We don't have that much. We've limited outside access at the moment. Yeah. And my daughter has started loving drawing. So we're doing this together. So any parents or even people sharing apartments or spaces, together and make them a together activity. Yeah. Okay. Actually, this so, reminds uh, me of, uh, I feel like a lot of partners out there, we, we keep hearing, right, of relationships are getting sunk <laughs> because of remote working. So people out there that are in a relationship that are like, I'm hating my partner right now, get drawn. <laughs> Sorry, keep coming. Yeah. Get drawn, get knitting, get knitting, get, knitting, get doing yeah. the crochet. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But, um, and then the last, the last, um, the last piece of the template just asks you, how you would make sure that you implement them in reality into action into your daily routine and that can be making sure that you have it in your schedule mat that you make a commitment maybe to an online you know course that you sign up to a subscription for audiobooks whatever helps you commit yeah. right yeah. and stick to the plan and that is like there's so much out there on well-being but trust me <laughs> That is the fundamental, and no one I have spoken to in these almost a year working with remote and home worker only on this stuff, no one has a perfect self-care plan. No one, when they're restricted with movement, with extra stress, has that, and it is proactive, Matt. That's what I want to say to people. It's proactive, and when people come to me and I do one-to-one -one sessions for insurance coming, and they say, I'm not productive when I sit at the machine, I don't ask about what they're doing at the machine. I understand what they're doing away from the machine. And often it is, they're looking at their phone, they're watching Netflix for five more hours at night. Their cum cumulative screen time is off the charts. Yeah. No wonder they can't concentrate because they're not unwinding, Matt, from anything. So, so you mentioned, so I love that. So I actually took notes of you know, the, the exact layout. So step one is sort of write down the why. Step two is have a self-care yeah. audit where you have the what of what are those activities. And step three is sort of the how, which I love yeah. that framework, right? Why, what, how? Um, yeah. so, so now what are some tactical tools? Because for me, I, I'm fighting with my calendar every single second. So on Sundays, I'm looking at my calendar saying, these are the top five things mm -hmm. I have to get done. This is when I'm plotting it out. And I actually would say I fit like gym and, you know, those kind of things into my calendar. But so what are some yeah. tactical tools that you've seen really, really help with this? So if you have a day where everything hits the fan, Matt, you have to have a plan B and then a plan C. Okay. Almost need to have the triggers in place so that if you know on a particular day that you didn't get any self-care, that you missed maybe the gym, that you had a particularly stressful day, what is it that you can do those smaller things, right? And, and so, uh, you know, is there three things of 10 minutes that you can do that you can answer me? tomorrow if you had a really busy day gotcha three okay. short activities you yeah yeah and 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 all of them away from a screen ideally and not many people can answer the, that straight off the cuff because most people say well i look at my phone i read the news all right yeah nope. if you pin people down and say three things that help you unwind that help you disconnect that are about 10 minutes in length three different things and thinking of the senses is the other way listening feeling hearing jogging a memory maybe looking at a photo album maybe you know good things that actually boost your mood a little bit but are more about disconnecting fully from technology and that's the bit that when we dive in and go into the detail with people, I've found that they need to look at that in more detail. And it might be the case that you need to do a little bit more intentional journaling, that you might want to say, I'm gonna to listen to an album, half of it, four songs, five songs, but listen to it, not be typing at the same time, not be, so does that make sense, Matt? It's the, it quality, the quality of those activities. 
So, so constantly having a plan B, plan C, and I think both right. a plan B in regards to, a, you know, more of a day, but also those micro like 10 minutes. And I think it's almost like it's, it's like a classical having your toolkit, right? And, and one of the things is understanding what are those cues that are positives or negatives within the toolkit. So like a negative in my toolkit is uh, Uber Eats. It's so easy. You just light it up. You get some cookies. <laughs> yeah. Like it's awesome. It's way too easy. A positive would be like the gym. Now, if you're sitting there and you're all burnt out and you're like, Jim, Uber Eats, Jim, Uber Eats, what do you think is going to happen? So, so what are some controls? that you've seen people put in place to make sure that they stay along the right path. Okay. So I've seen people build in accountability. Aha, I was hoping you'd say that. <laughs> okay. Tell me more. <laughs> so I do, I do direct mentoring with people to look at these healthy habits and I help them be accountable <laughs> yeah. to through booking sessions with this, which they pay for, for me, but I help them be accountable. And I also help them with the intentional, mantras they use in the morning or intention setting okay and like five minutes at the start of the day five uh, ten minutes on a friday morning matt where you are religiously booking your next week self-care into your calendar right yeah. with maybe reminders to take breaks with maybe a stick it on your machine that says do not order uber eats matt right i, I do that i do that <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. But, 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 you know, like, but then, then there's a point of self-responsibility and that's into the self-leadership, self-management theory yeah. as well. You would help to empower someone, maybe build in accountability, talk to them about maybe other positive supports in their network. Could yeah. they reach out and say, oh. brother, sister, friend, could you help me for one week to make sure that I take accurate breaks and can I check in with you? to hold further accountability. Um, there's work we could do on vis visualization as well to try and help that. Accountability helps, scheduling helps, writing helps. But also, if someone is being honest and authentic with you, Matt, and you have been already, you know where your flaws are, are your little downs, right? Your nags. Yep. Yep. And at least you know that. So I have to compliment you on your self-awareness. So then the ball would be back in your court. If you can know those and identify them, it is literally just a matter of will. And I'm not underestimating or, or, or saying that's easy, yeah. but it's, it's yeah. a case of then saying to yourself, do I really want to change this? And, and what would be the benefit? So, hmm. so uh, the other process that maybe a, a mentor or even a psychologist would take you through possibly is really feeling through the benefits of if you went to the gym over over uh, ordering uber eats yep yeah yep yep uh, um and so there's some hints but it's quite individual because most people come and particularly if they're mature remote workers they'll know their their downsides they'll know the negatives which actually so it feeds back into that why Right. Because like you mentioned, like you, 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 a little tidbit of a sentence of if you don't want to do something, you're not going to do it. And if you really, really want to do something, you're going to do it. So if you're not, if you haven't aligned why you're actually working yeah. remote or as a freelancer, all these controls and plans, they don't, they don't want to do, they won't do shit. And so, no, no. And, and one thing I actually think that you, that you called out as, as part of accountability that I wanted to call out is that I don't know the exact, so that psychological insight where I forget, they would take two profiles of people. One is super disciplined. One yeah. understands they're not disciplined. You would expect, it's like the marshmallow test. You'd expect yeah. that the super disciplined person would be the one that would become very successful. And I forget what mm -hmm. psychology, who, probably Kahneman or Sversky or one of those, right? Yeah. But so what they found out was it actually wasn't the super disciplined people that ended up being very successful in how they measured it was the people that recognized I'm not disciplined and they set the right yes, controls, yes. right? Little things, actually, this is yes. probably bad, but next to me, I have my running gear. It's all on the floor and the socks <laughs> are there, the, you know, the shorts are there, whatever. Cause I know I'm not going to want to go yeah. into my closet and grab it, but it's right there. So I'm shaming myself to, to keep looking at it and say, I oh, should, I haven't ran yet. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, no, that's really interesting. But can I just share one thing with you that I've learned yeah. through the years? It took me a while that I'm a morning person when it comes to exercise. And if I don't get out and do it in the morning by a certain time, it's gone for the rest of the day. You're, you're, you're now, one of those weirdos. I do break that my own. <laughs> just kidding. 
Just kidding. <laughs> but, 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 but hang on. But the positive is on that is, Matt, when, this is what, if I was mentoring you, I'd go, when do you definitely get out and do your run? You know, when, yeah. so you would look at when you're doing it through a little bit of reflection and from taking stock, doing some writing. And then what a mentor does is hypes up the positives. Okay, where are you doing good? Let's do more of that. Yeah. When is that working time of day? Let's do more of that. So I want to answer your, your question about controls and success by yeah. saying to people, focus on the positives. And the template does that. It's looking for what you're already doing and enhancing it. Gotcha, gotcha. Where, how important would you say is the community element of having people whether it's, you know, five to 10 trusted peers. Or... You're kind of frozen there, Matt. Oh no, you're frozen. How about now? How about now? Better now? Should be good now. I can see you perfectly. How about now? Yeah. This is the, okay. this is the beauty of freelancer talks. We want you all to know that you don't have to have perfect Wi-Fi in a production studio and it still works. You'll still get the contract. <laughs> um, but how important is the community element? specifically having peers or people to really, really, really social pressure you. Uh, I remember back in middle school when they talk about drugs, they'd be like, it's all about who you hang out with. And if your friends peer pressure you, you're going to do drugs. But so how, yeah, how important is that element of community, peers, you name it? I think, it, I think in terms of supporting what you said there, your values and the why you do it yeah. through to um, actually helping you support those healthy habits, yeah. then having open conversations, like even what we're doing, where I know, I know Matt, that running helps you unwind and keep a good self-care balance, right? Yeah. So if we were on a project, for example, and there was a barrier or a, or a roadblock, yeah. you know, in conversation, I could say, Matt, you might want to get out for an extra run tonight. And I might say, I'm going to do some painting, drawing with my daughter to unwind. Yeah. And that's where, when you say community, it's really important, but also we both work on remote teams. And if you share that self-care profile and what you do to support your whole self, yeah. first of all, we're all human. And we cannot underestimate that me showing a mandala, which some people might go, oh, that's cheesy. I, I'm going to sit down and do drawing guys to help me de-stress. I don't care what anyone thinks about that, right? With kids coloring pencils, with markers, because I have mental health. I have stress like everyone else. I need to take care of myself. So if I, as a remote advocate, hopefully trying to break the stigma, say that's what keeps, helps keep me on an even keel, yeah. then Matt, you'll hopefully say, well, I find this helps. So even that starts the right type of open conversation. Gotcha. So imagine if that's established in your community. We're all being honest. We're all sharing what works. Maybe we can join together and create an initiative where we do walking meetings, where we set a steps challenge, where we have a safe channel on Slack to express our feelings, where we have a health channel on Slack. Yeah. Think of all the good things that can come out of that. But segueing into what I wanted to also talk about is we start to create that safe space to talk about mental health and go, yeah, guys, this is how I take care of myself. This is what my personal downtime, but actually it's been a crap week and I need, I, I'm going to sign off for a few hours or I need to speak to someone or it's been difficult, yeah. whatever. And when you've shared about your personal care that supports you, Matt, and why it supports you, the obvious next step in a conversation is, what are the signs if you're stressed, Matt? What are the signs if you're stressed, Rowena? What would you do then? Have you thought through, could I help you? Could the team help you? Yeah. And we start to have the conversations that need to be had. So how do you, because I think this is, the, this is the last thing we're going to touch on, and I think it's by far the most important thing we've talked about and we'll talk about, and I think it's how do you break down or enable the environment so that people can feel like they can have these open and honest conversations. And because you, you touched on it, right? When I, when I mentioned mm -hmm. community, which I think was a great pushback of, it's not this generic community. Yeah. It's the deep connections where you yes. feel okay saying running is my ticker, you name it. Yeah. And even down to, I mean, 
there's, there's personal things you might want to say, mm-hmm. right? And, and yeah, yeah. It, this is one of the problems with working in large companies usually is if it, it can feel kind of stale and you don't really feel like yeah, yeah. personal. Whereas in freelance communities, when you're having a little collective, you, you, you know, you're just closer. But so I'd love to hear, you know, what should our freelancers be thinking and doing to create spaces that they can have these very, very honest and open dialogues, like you mentioned running, like mm. what, yeah. What have you seen be kind of okay. the best practice? Okay, so it's very obvious, but it really works. Non-social calls, non-work calls. So if you're in a collective, okay. right? If you're yeah. in a collective, just even once a month, okay? Look for that space where it says no work talk, okay? Gotcha. And you have your calls. Lead, leading on from that, and I mean, that's where hopefully some good connections, some good exchanges happen. Leading on from that, support that with a social channel on Slack or whatever instant messaging system that you're using that says funny gags, social channel, maybe have more than one, right? Which is, okay, which is the... the, the Dog you know, memes. Ours Dog is gifts. Memes. Gifts is our, uh, is our cue, right? Whatever. Whatever, everyone that joins, are like, you better send a gift. So. Whatever, right? Whatever. Yeah. And then people listening, I'm going to call out to people listening because mental health, and it's why I've chosen to do this today with you while we're having an open conversation. What has happened in the last year in terms of mental health awareness and conversation has accelerated 10 years what, what should be happening. Yeah. So there are people listening who will go, I'm comfortable with talking about whatever, a personal experience, a family experience, maybe they've, they're doing it already. Those people that are comfortable with that lead a little bit the conversation, share. Yeah. There are safe ways of sharing. I'll give you another example, a simple whiteboard, visual whiteboard, mural, mirror, whatever, where you just share your personal self-care tips, right? Okay. Then you lead on from that in a social chat where you talk about what we've just demonstrated you know, Matt, and the, you know, if you were stressed, would I notice the signs? You uh, said that that self care helps you de stress, but if you were stressed, would I notice the signs? Now, people listening, and I'm talking to them specifically that are comfortable with this, could you lead by example by saying, when I'm stressed, I sweat, or I, I, I go quiet, or I, I decline calls? Yeah. That, even that little piece of sharing makes it okay for people to go i know what you mean i disappear as well um when i'm stressed i would i I would like my own space or when i'm stressed i'm overwhelmed so i pull back from all comms or when i've had stress this is what's happened in the past so i just want to flag it so you can understand me better now some people don't feel comfortable with that but we've gone the full circle matt too when we would all sit in a room and you would look over and you would see someone with the bags under their eyes with the posture down and you would turn to them and go you're looking a bit tired today mate what's going on and they would go oh the baby was up for the last five nights or i'm having stress and we have to be more intentional to fill that gap and to open the conversation and the thing is because virtual and remote can be more participative we can actually make the conversation as it grows a better conversation. Gotcha. I really believe that. Gotcha. So, so in terms of the, the things I jotted down was, you know, in terms of how to create open spaces. So number one, no work calls. Love that. Yeah. Number two, mm-hmm. no work, a no work channel. So like a fun social mm-hmm. channel. Yeah. Number three, you mentioned like whiteboarding, collaborating, but I think yeah. it's like getting deep in the weeds together. And then I think number yeah. four, which, which really glues it together is, being open on cues. So if you knew like, this is this person's cue. Um, now yeah. I have an, I have an interesting question and I don't think there's an answer to this. Mm-hmm. Similar to the placebo effect in psychology, right? You give a hundred mm-hmm. people a drug, 50 are on a placebo, somehow 24 don't actually, you know, it didn't work, but they think it worked. Have you noticed a uptick in, because we talk about it so much, people actually getting mental illness or depression or anxiety and what i mean by that is you know the bad side is the the 50 years ago and this is uh, Mm -hmm. i guess 
very this is a manly mm -hmm. thing right is you you mm -hmm. get out of the mill yard you're pissed off but the person just tells you suck it up and show up tomorrow and work <laughs> hard right that's the too uh -huh. bad side where no one has feelings but yeah. have you noticed sort of a counter effect where when it becomes more open apparent and everyone's talking about it that there becomes people that were okay but start to get a little more anxiety or a little of a placebo have you noticed that I, no, I tell you what, what I have to say here, and, and this is just like mental health. So I'm not, a, I said I was going to, I'm not a psychologist. Yes, I'm not here's the disclaimer. Person. Yes. Here's the disclaimer, right? <laughs> if you came to me with, uh, and I have a way, a lot of uh, mentors in certain services, we have a way of doing an audit or a review with you. And if you need serious mental health support, we refer you on, right? But mental health is different to mental illness. Uh -huh. really different than the language gotcha gotcha okay okay so so people don't realize that and the the term mental health so you say to me are people more aware of their mental health as in i'm a little bit stressed today right or yeah. or yeah I'm, I'm i'm i have a bit of anxiety over that big event coming or whatever it might be that is being aware of your mental form your mental health form Okay. Mental illness is a totally different thing, Matt. Yeah. I'm not an expert on it, but I have done my mental health first day. I was hoping you'd share that. Yes, yes. And it's something that's worldwide available, which means that you are able to help and be a first point of contact for someone under mental stress, possibly yeah. leading to mental illness, who are starting to have signs like you know, heart, because sometimes people have physical signs, sleeplessness, insomnia, heart raised heart rate etc 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 and the thing is that there is checklists and supports that you will go through with those people so i hope i'm answering your question because i think the awareness you has you ha has brought up brought more talk about it and maybe a little bit more what's the word sort of i've got I've got a condition or I've, maybe a bit of that yeah. of course but is that a good thing in the long run yes because I would rather people speak about it because if we don't speak about it and start to acknowledge this, we can proactively yeah. catch it and go, all right, you're just stressed. You need to take a day off work and go and do nothing for yourself, or you need to stop working nights next week or yeah. whatever. And that maybe, as you said, if there's open conversation, one of your colleagues might say, Matt, you're burning the candle at both ends. Get offline, right? Go and go and run for the next five nights or whatever. And that, I mean, I have that in my network. I have those people who will call me out. My husband does it <laughs> <laughs> if needed. And I do it for him. But, but because the, we're, we're human, we will occasionally break our own rules. But the point is, that's the framework that you can put in, that you can try and keep to your own framework, your own rules, your own routine where you can. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I think the glue that holds that together is, you know, you can, we can recognize it, but you are saying I have the tools and tactics to actually help that. And I think it's, yeah. you know, and, and I, I teach it at a university once a semester and, and I have noticed there's a rise and it's kind of like a badge of honor. Some people to be like, I have depression. I have anxiety. <laughs> cool. This is going to fix it for you. It doesn't excuse you to be an a-hole <laughs> or, or to yeah, not be your exactly. home, right? So I think what you do is you plug the hole from, you know, look at me, everyone. I have depression to, mm. ah, it, it, we're sorry, but here is the technical way to get out of it because we all have depression and anxiety. At times. Yes, it's, we all, we all, it's like, I mean, it, it, you know, life. we've all, it's like, it's life. I mean, if it's a very serious condition, schizophrenia, bipolar, of course that's different or severe depression or whatever, but we, but that's where doing the training, if you're listening and you're interested, doing the training or, or educating yourself. And also, like I have to say at the moment though, Matt, some of those people wearing the badge, if yeah. they're slowing down and yeah. still taking care of themselves, that's the most important thing. And then secondly, too much talk is not a bad thing, but I think this type of, this type of language will, will calm down. It will become more understood. Yeah. And, and, and the main people to freelance, the main message I want to say to people is you are self leaders, you are self managers. And what, what you need to take away, please, from today is just spend that time enhancing your self care. Know yourself well enough that if you got on a call with me, you can answer me 
what your three 10 minutes a day yeah. supports are start to build it out and be advocates in your collective math in those collectives yeah. on on venture oh, be the advocates that lead the way because change is happening and we will all be healthier and happier if these conversations happen I love that. that. That's the final quote to sail off in the sunset. Okay, you ready for the rocket round? You're going to have three questions. You only have oh, wow. 10 seconds to answer each. Wow. You, you ready? You nervous? Yeah. I'm nervous because no. I kind of okay. forgot the question. Okay. <laughs> okay, ready? Favorite movie? Wolf of Wall Street. Really? I would not expect that from you. Well, that, that's... <laughs> There's always some gleaning insights. Wow. <laughs> All right. Sweet. Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, favorite book? Uh, favorite book. Oh, that's a difficult one. <laughs> I, I want to answer the first one again. Gone what? with the Wind. Gone with the Wind for the first one would be better, actually, because that's really I'm hurt. keeping Wolf of Wall Street. Sorry. <laughs> no. Nope. Um, You're keeping the chest pump in Wolf of Wall Favorite book is the one I'm writing. Oh, that was a good plug. <laughs> nice. Give us some links. We'll put it in the description. Um, okay. Last question. My favorite one. Favorite animal. Meerkat. Definitely. Every time. That fits you perfectly. That, that, <laughs> that is so perfect. Rowena, thank you so much for hopping on. Thank you, Matt. Can't, wait, can't wait for our freelancers to meet you. Lo lovely. Thank you so much, Matt.